forgot to mute my I ain't got my mic on yet either. I forgot to mute my YouTube stream, so I had to do that so we won't get an echo. Uh, can you hear me all right with my lapel mic? I can just barely see the comments, but if someone lets me know if they can hear me, all will be well and we'll get underway. And I gotta wait for the delay on it to start popping up here anyway. Alrighty. One of my members, Lori Gofford, was having trouble making scallops the other day. They were sticking to her cast iron pan. She couldn't figure out why. Well, neither could I really. It's been a long time since I made scallops, but she seemed to be doing everything right. And it seemed like it make a pretty good video to try and make some scallops myself, see if I can get them to work or see if I can get them to screw up and maybe figure out what went wrong. So what I did is I got me some frozen scallops. You're not likely to find fresh scallops here in Wisconsin. I, let them, I put them in a drainer in a bowl and let them thaw in the refrigerator overnight and uh, cover it with plastic so they wouldn't dry out. And I brought them out a couple hours ago and uh, let them drain a little more and warm up to more or less room temperature. And I took some of them and I drained them on paper towel. You want these as dry as you can get them before you start frying. You want them to sear real fast and real hard. And if they're wet, they won't sear right. You also don't want to overcrowd your pan with too many at one time. Because as the juice cooks out, it'll uh, start boiling them instead of letting them sear. The pan I'm going to use is this little made in Taiwan pan. This pan just browns really great. You can tell by the buildup on it. I use it quite a bit. It's one of my favorite pans, actually. And it's a little made in Taiwan jobby that I got at a thrift sale for 50 cents, maybe 25. So, you know, don't uh, turn your nose up at something just because it's made in Taiwan automatically. I'm going to turn this on fairly high. Kind of a medium high temperature. This is going to warm up a little bit. And I'm going to be cooking them in clarified butter. I use clarified butter for probably 99% of my cooking whenever I fry something. And uh, while this is warming up, let's see if I can see any of the uh, comments. Yeah, you can hear me loud and clear. All right. I just I did turn the right. No, I didn't. I turned the wrong damn burner on. There we go. Thought I was getting a little warm over here. Anyway, while I'm waiting for this to get warmed up, I'm going to have a membership drive. I want to get to 20 members. I got 12 right now. And if I can get up to 20 members, I'm going to do a giveaway for everybody on the YouTube side of things. And uh, I will, once we get there, I'll make a video. And I'm going to give away two, not just one, two different items. I kind of got an idea of what I'm going to give away, but we'll keep that for a surprise. So, tell your friends, tell your family, get them to sign up, and you will have a chance to win a fabulous, fabulous prize. Anyway, this is warming up. Still getting there. Uh, happy Thursday from Australia. Well, happy Wednesday evening from Wisconsin, Deb. Uh, four day homestead just listening anyway you want to get this good and hot and you want to get your oil good and hot because you want them to sear right away i've also got some salt pepper paprika and a little bit of cayenne all mixed up and ready to go you don't want to season these until right before they go into the pan because salt draws moisture out and if you season them too soon before you're ready to cook it will uh, draw moisture out of them and it'll make them tougher to sear too. So that's another little trick you got to know about scallops. Like I said, it's been ages since I made these. So this could be either a success or a complete disaster. Whoops, get on the plate you. And I won't know until I actually do it. Set him aside. 
Okay, that's getting warm. I can throw oh, a goodish amount of uh, clarified butter in there. I'll let that one melt first and see how much we get. You don't want to deep fry them, but you don't want to be short on your oil either. I really like clarified butter. It's got a good flavor to it, and it has a really high smoke point. You know, a lot higher than most uh, cooking oils. So when it comes to doing stuff like this, you can get your pan a lot hotter without it smoking than you could using a, you know, a basic vegetable oil or olive oil or something like that. A little bit more. And for some reason, my stove, no matter what I do to it, it never quite sit le sits level. I'll get it leveled. It'll be okay for about a day. Then it'll start to go away again. Okay, that's just about hot enough. Temperature should be okay. So, I'm going to season my scallops. Give them a little sprinkle. Flip them over. Ooh, just starting to smoke a little bit. That's right where we want the temperature to be. Make sure the oil is all around and covering good and then the pan will go. The scallops are notorious for sticking. If you ever watch Kitchen Nightmare or uh, Hell's Kitchen on TV, even the more or less professional cooks on there have a hell of a time sometimes with scallops. But any protein, whether it's meat, poultry, eggs, or seafood, will always stick to cast iron when you first put it in until it starts to sear. And once it's seared, see, this guy, well, once it's seared, it should release right away. And these guys are not stuck at all, but I don't think we're quite seared. Well, searing a little bit. I'm gonna swirl that around, make sure we got oil everywhere. And they don't take very long. It should only take about 30, 35 seconds to a side. See if that isn't seared down good. I'm going to press them a little bit just to make sure they're whoop, fried down good. That was got a nice sear on it. Yeah, I think I start flipping them. You bet. Then we're looking nice. You see this one here is stuck back down because the raw side is back down now. But that should let go as soon as it sears off. Got my plate here. I'm also going to make a little bit of a, I don't want to go so far as to call it a sauce, but a little bit of a pan sauce. How are we doing here? Oh yeah, we're pretty good. Oop, that needs a little more. Nice crustiness going for them. And I'd say these guys are done. It took so long it didn't even quite get the handle of the pan hot. But I will take these guys off. We'll leave that on there. We we'll take a little bit of minced garlic. that much. A little pat of cold butter. That'll cool things down so my garlic doesn't burn. Kind of rub that around. I want that garlic to fry up a little bit. And then, once that butter is all melted, I'm going to deglaze my pan with a little white wine. Scrape it around a bit to get all the little bits and pieces and fry it on bits off. I 
and pour a little bit of that over my scallops. There. And that's all there is to that. Not the most beautifulest presentation, but turn my stove off. We'll see how they taste. They seared up nice on the sides. Mm. Yeah, them are real good. So, uh, what problem Lori had with hers, I really don't know. Said she used plenty of oil. She seemed to have done everything right. So I can't really tell exactly what the problem might have been. But at any rate, these here turned out good. And you don't necessarily need a non-stick pan to make fried scallops and not have them stick to your pan. I'm going to try another one of them quick. Yeah, them are just tasty. Seared up good. They didn't cook too much and get all rubbery on me. I'm going to let my dog in. I'm going to move my camera back around. Well, actually, I have to move my camera first. Get all this stuff organized. And then I'll be able to have a look-see at what all you folks were saying. I'm going to mute my mic for a second here while I let the barking little critter in. I am forever forgetting to turn that overhead light off when I move around and sit back down here. Let's see. Well, you don't need to see my welder sitting there. Usually I got that parked in the bathroom because where else would you keep your welder but in the bathroom? All right, back up and see if I missed anything important in the comments here. Uh, hi, James, Ron Thompson, Billy Lee Lahan, Labry's Farm, Dennis Fott, Ron Thompson, Nack Morris, uh, Donna Engel, Tracy Aaron, Clone Ranger, Four Day Homestead, Deb, I already said hi to you, Deb, Judy, Judy Abernathy. Where did I buy the scallops? I just got them at the grocery store in the uh, frozen seafood department. Yeah, those would be good over noodles. Last time we had a cornbread pan to make pies and now scallops. Yeah, the, uh, you know, cornbread pans work pretty slick for that. Get my dog in the way here. Got wire strung all over. I had to set this up a little bit different to reach over to the stove and see what I was doing. Uh, six inch pans that work just fine no stick at all yeah usually you know if it's well seasoned you use the pan for a while and it's all broke in good you usually don't have much trouble with things sticking even uh scallops like that you know and i was really really kind of wondering why you know she was having such a problem with them sticking 
maybe too cold, maybe not quite hot enough, but she said she had it screaming hot. And, uh, you know, it just, it doesn't make much sense. You know, and it's, she said it was a pan that she used quite a bit, so it shouldn't have really been a problem. You know, the only thing that I could really think of is they just might have been a little bit too wet was all I could, all I could really come up with. Yeah, I ate a bunch more of them when I was letting the dog in too. And I'll fry up the rest of them as, uh, you know, once we get done here, I'll fry up the rest of those and have them for supper. I really should have had a little bit of lemon juice. I had them on my list and I forgot to get lemons. And when I was setting this up, once I went to make the sauce, I realized I didn't even get the uh, bottle of lemon juice out of the free, out of the fridge. So but a little bit of lemon would have been really ideal in that. Wet. Yeah, there's, especially once something's been frozen, it draws a lot of moisture out of it. And, uh, yeah, you know, if they're wet, it won't sear, it'll just boil. You know, but she, you know, said that she had done that too. You know, they were, you know, thought they were pretty dry. Maybe she seasoned them a little too early and they, it drew out enough moisture while they were sitting there waiting to throw them in the pan. That's, you know, some little, it has to be some little uh, minor thing like that because, uh, you know, like I said, you know, we, we're talking about it on the uh, Facebook site. It seemed like she was doing everything right. So, you know, and I don't know if it makes a difference if they're too thick. You know, if they're really thick, they'll cook out more liquid and won't want to sear and release. You know, that could be. But, uh, yeah, as far as I know, her pan was, uh, was uh, is seasoned right. So... Yeah, that could be something that would make a difference too, but, you know, generally if it's something that you've used a few times, you know, seasoning isn't really usually an issue. Yeah, fresh, fresh mussels, scallops, and fish. We can get, you know, some, you know, I do a lot of fishing around here. Well, I can do a lot of fishing. I haven't really been out much the last few years, which is disappointing because I live somewhere you can't hardly walk. 100 yards and not fall in a lake or a pond and all the millions of places to fish around here i've hardly got out lately but uh you can catch a lot of fresh fish yourself but you know things like uh you know crabs lobster scallops things like that you know, i mean you're not you can find them fresh for if you want to pay the price but you can't really find anything that hasn't been frozen for any sort of reasonable amount of money you know live lobsters you can get some places <clears throat> you can get live lobster some places and uh you know still live so they're good and fresh but other than that you're pretty much on your own looking for uh anything fresh for seafood yeah lake fish aren't always the best you can uh you know sometimes you got mercury you know, different lakes from uh, pollution, from mercury, from uh, usually it's from coal-fired power plants. It's kind of like acid rain, but there's, you know, mercury in the uh, air and it settles out into lakes and streams. And if there's industrial pollution in the area, you got to keep an eye out for that sort of thing too. But, you know, these are all mostly small glacial lakes around here, so there's not really much for uh, industrial pollution beyond anything that can settle out of the air. You know, there's you know, there's quite a few bodies of water all over the U.S. really where they have mercury advisories where you shouldn't eat the fish more than once a week or pregnant women shouldn't eat them, things like that. Uh, it depends on the fish and the temperature of the water, you know, like, uh, you know, carp, if you catch them early in the spring when the water's cold, they're pretty good. Oh, the video's buffering. Yeah, YouTube has been screwy the last couple, three days. You know, people have been having a hell of a problem with, uh, with, uh, things, you know, buffers. I've had the same problem watching other people's streams. It'll start buffering every 10, 15 seconds. 
you might have to refresh the page and uh, you know just come back and hit play again. And it should pick up right where we are now. Yeah, living on the Gulf Coast, you know, it's kind of nice when you actually live near seafood for live near the sea and you can get seafood easy enough. But anyway, yeah, some fish are, you know, naturally kind of soft, especially once the, the water turns warm. But a lot of panfish like, uh, you know, bluegills, perch and crappies, things like that, they usually stay pretty good. The meat stays pretty good uh, all summer long. Yeah, I've never made soft shell crabs because uh, yeah, I'm nowhere near anywhere you can get soft shell crabs. You can catch crayfish though if you want, crayfish or crawdads, whatever you want to call them. They're fairly common around here. Yeah, clone, I don't think it's really the video settings. It's, it's a problem on YouTube's end. I mean, they've been having it pretty much system wide. You know, everybody everybody uh watching streams or doing streams has been having the same problem it wants to keep buffering every few seconds sometimes like i said usually if you refresh and uh come back in it'll take off and go for you i've been quitting smoking using these little nicotine packs for the last couple three days they work out pretty good at least get the nicotine fix going Hi, Mary. Over there in Michigan, are ya? But anyhow, uh, finally moved. You may have noticed that my lye bath isn't sitting there anymore. Finally got that out on the porch. Well, emptied out and took the uh, tote out on the porch. I got to mix up a new one. And uh, getting closer, getting caught up on some of the other things. I'm going to have to put a new oil pump in my truck. I mentioned that last week. Either the uh, spring on the relief plunger on there that regulates the pressure on the oil pressure is weak. And once it warms up, it won't hold pressure. Or there's just enough uh, wear in the pump itself. You know, but either way, it doesn't really matter. It means i got to put a new pump in regardless. Oh, quitting smoking ain't so bad. I've done it a dozen times at least, so maybe one of these times it'll actually take. But yeah, it's not a fun uh, addiction to try and break. Can you hear that silly dog snoring down by my feet? Oh, uh, yeah, it's real bare anyway. Uh, let's see. I'll cut up on that. Uh, what else I got going on? Like I said, I was going to mix up the new, uh, mix up the new lye bath. And I'm trying to find decent electrodes for my uh, new electrolysis tank. I want to build a bigger one. I don't know if I'd make it all the way to Maryland. But yeah, that'd be kind of fun. You know, uh, pretty soon here, I'm going to see if I can't talk somebody into coming in as a guest on here. You know, I don't know exactly, you know what I mean? Just bringing some, sending out a link and bringing somebody in isn't too much of a uh, problem, but trying to set up a little more involved stream, I'll have to see if we figure out what's that. Have I tried any of the new cast iron pans out? Uh, no, you know, most of them are pretty expensive and I'm a cheap bastard, so I don't like to pay a whole lot of money for them. Even used, I see uh, once in a while, I see like a used Finex pan or something like that on uh, eBay or different auction sites. But they usually go for better than 100 bucks a piece, which isn't too bad. They're usually like 150, 175 new for uh, Finex, I think. 
but I haven't seen any uh, any like Field Company or Butter Patch or any of those of the other ones coming up on uh, for sale used yet. But I'm sure when they do, because most of them are like 150 to 200 dollars brand new. You know, what I mean they'll still sell for probably 125 to 150 a piece. Will you show how to build the new electrolysis tank? Yeah, I'll have to do it on the video. You know, I won't be able to live stream it because I can't get set up outside. But, uh, you know, I'll make some videos about doing that. And I got a cooking video that I'm going to film later on this week, either tomorrow or Friday. Should have that up by this weekend. And uh, once I find some decent electrodes, I've been looking around and... Uh, I was just going to take some uh, cookie sheets and use those on the sides and one for kind of a divider for the uh, electrodes in the tank. But all the ones I can find in secondhand stores are either aluminum coated or they got, uh, well, most of them are aluminized. Or they got some kind of, uh, you know, non-stick coating on them. I could throw them in a fire and burn them off if I wanted to, but, you know, it's more hassle I feel like hassling with. I'm gonna see what I got around here for. Uh, see what I got around here for uh, for uh, scrap iron that I can use that would work out all right. Yeah, fiddleheads. I'm, we're a little bit past the fiddlehead ferns around here. You know, I mean the ferns are up. You know, they're a foot tall already. You know, they're all opened out, so they're not. You know, not at the eating stage anymore. You know, but there's, if I knew anything about mushrooms, there's a lot of different mushrooms around here, but I'm not about to go learning because I really don't want to poison myself. But there is, over at the neighbor's place, I know they've got, we call it chicken in the woods, hen in the woods, and it grows on the sides of a tree, and it's delicious. And you just uh, slice it up and... You slice it up and uh, and uh, roll it in flour and fry it. But you want to eat it when it's still just barely cooled enough that you don't burn your mouth to death. Because once it gets cold, it still tastes great, but the texture gets kind of slimy. And uh, yeah, you can use re-rod for electrodes. I'm using some angle iron in the tank I got going now. And uh, yeah, I got plenty of angle iron, but I wanted to try and find something that was more of a wide sheet. Or a divider between I want to make it in two sides on the same tank and uh, you know I can cobble something together but it wasn't quite what I had in mind but yeah re-rod works good as long as it's not the uh, not the epoxy coated green re-rods pretty much any kind of uh, steel or iron as long as it isn't uh, isn't plated or you shouldn't use stainless you know I've seen some people have uh, that have been testing their electrolysis tanks to see if it's actually drawing chromium into the water or hexavalent chrome especially which is toxic but a lot of nickel compounds aren't very good for you there's both chrome and nickel in the uh in stainless steel you'll pick up a little metallic chrome and a little bit of metallic nickel from stainless steel or from you know plated cast iron but the uh, metallic forms itself are okay it's once it's dissolved into a solution that it causes problems yeah old lawnmower blades work good yeah in the fall i get some great big kind of toadstool type mushrooms out in the yard you know and i know i've heard for, that they're definitely not edible they're not poisonous but they taste nasty and they don't uh you know, it's not something you want to eat. It ain't going to kill you, but they're kind of cool because they get huge. I mean, they get, you know, I mean, I've seen some of them that were 8, 10 inches across. And they last for about a day. Then they turn nasty and slimy and just kind of fall into a pile of goo after a little while. Yeah, there's another kind of, uh, I've seen it before. You know, I've been out with people that pick them. My grandpa used to pick them all, all the time. They're a small brown mushroom that grows around here, and uh, they're pretty good. But I just don't, uh, like I say, I don't really want to learn, and I'm not going to 
try and eat something I don't know what it is. Because there are some around here that are definitely poisonous. Couldn't tell you what they are offhand, but they are definitely here. But uh, my kids went out one day years ago just looking around, you know, picking different kinds of moss and mushrooms. And they came back with just a big tray of some of the damnedest looking mushrooms and things that you'd ever seen. You know, a lot of them were really pretty, but I you know, definitely wouldn't want to eat any of them. So there's, a, you know, there's definitely stuff around here. Undersized the pink gills and grows in lots of yards. Yeah, the little brown ones grow everywhere around here. I'm sure they have a name, but I don't know what it is. Do you have any apple crisp recipes? Uh, yeah, you know, I probably have to uh, do that come fall once I got some apples. Because uh, I finally got the cider press. I'd wanted one for years and years and years. And uh, I had a bunch of apple trees. And I got to use it one year. I made, oh, geez, I pressed out probably about 25 bushels of apples you know, got maybe 20, 25 gallons of cider out of it. And that winter was a real bad winter and half of my apple trees winter killed. So, but I still got a couple that are producing pretty good. I got a, it's called a Northern Lights. It's a cross between a Harlson and a Macintosh. And uh, that took quite a beating in that winter, but it uh, it's come back pretty good and it's bearing again. And I still got my beacon tree and uh, I got a couple of wild apples that were just volunteers, you know, grew on their own. One's a little small, it's bigger than a crab apple, you know, but it's a small apple. I mean, it's only about that big around. And it's a little tart, but it's got a real good flavor to it. And I'm sure that's just a wild one. Then there's another one growing up on the hill. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's a uh, Harlson because we had a Harlson tree. And planting apple seeds. It's kind of a crapshoot. A lot of times the seeds will grow whatever the original rootstock of the tree is, and most of the apple trees you buy are grafted. They'll use a wild apple rootstock because it's real hardy, and they'll graft on whatever breed of tree that you're, uh, you know, you're trying to propagate. But there's a lot of them too that are own root, where they'll, where they'll take a, a cutting from it and let the cutting take root and go from there so those will throw more or less true to whatever type of tree it is but if you you know like the uh, red delicious apples you get in the store if you plant the seeds from them and if they sprout you're never going to get a red delicious apple out of it and a lot of times it'll depend too on what they uh pollinated with if there's different different breeds of apple in the same orchard you can get some odd cross breeds and you know, you never, if you try and grow apple from seed, you never know what you're going to get. And, uh, you know, that one that grew up on the hill just so happened to be, it might not be an actual Harlson, but it's pretty similar. I'm pretty sure that it is. You know, I get a fairly good bunch of apples off that too. You know, but I went from getting, you know, 25, 30 bushels of apples off my trees a year down to, you know, maybe five, maybe eight at the most. And, uh, one of them, the beacon, is an every other year tree. Some breeds of apples only really produce heavy every other year. You'll get a few every year, but you know, one year you get maybe 50 apples on a big tree, and the next year you'll get bushels and bushels off of it. And that's just the way they, the way they go. But yeah, once I get some apples, I'll probably make some apple crisp. Yeah, it's empty. I don't have my water. Hang on, I'll be right back. Talk among yourselves.
I know I've been threatening you with it for a while, but uh, I'm finally going to get, I should have grabbed that when I was up, uh, finally going to get on with uh, doing some welding on cast iron too, you know, welding and brazing, I got all the stuff that I need, and uh, getting caught up on enough things that I can hopefully get enough time to uh, set up and do it. You know, I'm going to grab that. I've got a uh, waffle iron, you know, a nice Griswold waffle iron that I want to fix. Let's see, a little running into my stuff here. And it's got a broken knob on it. Oh, yeah, knock more stuff over. It's a uh, number eight Griswold waffle iron. It's got a 1908 date on it. This side is just fine and dandy, but this one has a little knob broke off. And that's going to be going to be a challenge to fix that because where it actually is broken is very, very thin where you'd have to try and weld that. But I've got a uh, uh, high nickel wire for my wire feed welder. And I should be able to weld it up with that. After I, that'll be one of the last ones I do once I get, uh, get a little more practiced into it. Because, uh, you know, I've been doing a little bit more welding. I used to do lots and lots of welding. And I was pretty good at it. But it's the sort of thing that you got to stay in practice with. You kind of lose your touch at it after a while if you're not uh, doing it a whole lot. So I had some welding to do on my loader on my tractor this spring. And they're good solid welds, but they ain't pretty. And like I say, it's, you know, welding cast is, is a bit tricky. Uh, Shirley has an Apple Crisp recipe. Yeah, there's lots of them out there. And uh, I'll have to get a hold of Ma, see if I can get her Apple Crisp recipe. She used to make a hell of a good, a good Apple Crisp. What do you think of these pans being cut into spatulas? No, I haven't seen that. You know, some things, you know, you can repair, and some things probably couldn't repair, but... Uh, you know, cost is a big issue. If you have to pay somebody to do it, it's going to cost you a lot more than a pan would be worth if you're trying to resell it because, you know, the repair really knocks value down. But if it's a family heirloom or something that has a lot of sentimental value, you know, it could be worthwhile to do it. Or if you got a bunch of, you know, cracked pans and something like that, and you could do it yourself and do it as cheaply as possible, you might be able to make a little bit of a profit at it. Uh, cast Iron Restore, do you have any uh, videos on that? You know, it could be, a, you know, if you have a pan that's really beyond repair or one that really isn't worth repairing, you know, that could be a decent way to reuse them. That'd be kind of slick to have a cast iron spatula made out of an old skillet. I've also got a, a square, I think I showed you this last time around, I've got a square, uh, got a square Wagner Ware skillet that doesn't have a handle. Then I've got a cheap little uh, fajita pan that has a handle that's fairly close. It's curved anyway because, i can get this in the camera angle right. Originally this had a, uh, a curved handle to it and uh, I got a fajita pan, you know, just a cheap made in China one, but that has a curved handle on it and it should, you know, match a little better than just, you know, trying to stick a straight handle on that. But I'll sacrifice that fajita pan and see if I can rehabilitate this. I mean, that would work great for a bacon dish right now. It's dirty. I've never, I haven't done anything with it yet. It's got to be stripped down. I mean, you could definitely use that for a nice little baking dish, but it'd be kind of slick to get a handle back on it and be able to use it for a skillet again. 
but I only paid a couple of bucks for that because it doesn't have a handle. And on something like that, you know, with a decent job of repairing a handle, you could probably turn around and sell it for 15, 20 bucks. But, uh, you know, the welding rod and the supplies are fairly expensive for welding cast iron. But you could probably make, you know, five, ten dollars on the deal if you wanted to uh, do something like that. Cast iron cab on Instagram. Yeah, I'll have to look into that and see what I can do with it. Yeah, I mean, like a minor crack in the sidewall, a lot of times you can still use the pan, even if it is cracked. You know, there's a bit of a risk that the crack will spread and uh, it'll break more. But usually, you know, minor hairlines in the side aren't too big of a deal. But if you got something where it's cracked all the way across the bottom, that would be real tough to fix. And, uh, don't look getting tangled in my wires, you little dog. Hi, Katie. Yeah, you know, but, uh, welding cast iron, you have to use, you can't just use regular mild steel welding rod on it. You have to use a, uh, they call it nickel 55. It's 55% nickel and the rest of the rod is iron because, uh, mild steel when the weld freezes you know seems kind of weird thinking about something that hot freezing but that's what it does when it solidifies the uh mild steel contracts a lot more than cast iron can because cast iron has no ductility to it you can't stretch it and as the metal cools it tries to shrink and stretch around it and instead of welding up the crack you end up making a crack on either side of the weld that you just made but the uh, nickel iron rod doesn't shrink like that. Yeah, drilling the end of the crack so it doesn't run any farther. You know, a lot of times you can do that. You know, a lot of times uh, machinists will do that when they're repairing a, uh, you know, cast iron engine block. You know, they'll drill both ends of the crack so it can't run past the drill hole and then weld it up in between. You know, I'll probably give that a try. Uh, how'd the scallops go? They went real good. Turned out nice. They didn't, uh, you know, didn't stick any longer than they were supposed to. They browned up good. Forgot to get the lemon for my sauce, but other than that, they were real nice. And yeah, you know, I mean, like I said, I've threatened you with doing a video on welding up iron, but uh, hopefully I'll finally get around to actually doing it here within the next couple of weeks. That's what I made me for. I got a couple other welding projects I have to do anyway, so I'll have everything all drug out and set up. You know, like I say, you can see my welder sitting on this little cart there. Yeah, Katie, I'm not sure what uh, what problem Lori was having, why they were sticking. You know, mine didn't. They released just the, just like they should have. So I uh, keep grabbing the empty can. You know, they released just like they should have, you know, and like I say, I can't really figure out why, why she was having such a hard time with her sticking down like that. Hey, Prairie Queen, always good to see you. Busy, got me burping. I really like that bold ginger ale. You know, it's not quite as strong as good ginger beer is but you know, it's pretty good it's got a little more ginger i love ginger you know i mean i love spicy things not necessarily terribly hot but something that's got a lot of a lot of spice to it yeah it should be fun i'm gonna do a you know do on brazing mig welding and and uh stick welding on cast iron i got i got a couple of pans that i can work fix up you know just to uh See how it goes. And I got a couple of old bits of iron that I can weld. And I got to fix a piece of that stove. Yeah, that would be one. Uh, prairie, that would be one of the things that make them stick. You know, if you didn't have your pan hot enough. You know, a lot of times if you have your pan too hot, you can have problems with things sticking. But with, you know, the scallops, you want them to really sear real fast. But uh, we were discussing it on the Facebook Facebook page and 
you know, as far as both of us could tell, she was doing everything right. And, uh, you know, there's really no reason why it was sticking, but she, they were. And they just would not let go. Uh, Brenda making dinner. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, uh, you know, terribly hard to make. It's just uh, seared scallops. But like I said before, it was, you know, discussing on Facebook page, someone was having problems with their scallops sticking and we couldn't figure out why because, you know, it shouldn't have been, shouldn't really been a problem. Uh, not seasoned great. Yeah, that could do it too. But as far as I know, you know, it was a decently seasoned pan. And uh, if you have a pan that browns better than your other ones do, because all cast iron pans are a little bit different, even if it's the same brand, the same size, you know, sometimes you'll have a pan that works better in the oven and uh, really bakes things good. And sometimes you'll have one that works better on the stovetop. It really browns nice. You know, like I said, that, you know, little cheap made in Taiwan pan, just fantastic for browning things, you know, for frying potatoes or, uh, you know, searing up scallops, you know, for some reason it just, you know, works really, really good for searing things. You know, and it's not, uh, you know, I have a lot of other light pans that work good, but this particular one just seems to, seems to have whatever it takes to sear things real nice. Yeah, I can't wait for the giveaways. Oh yeah, Brenda, you missed that. I'm having a membership drive. When I get to 20 members, I'm going to give away not one, but two different things. It's going to be a surprise, what they will be, but it'll be on the YouTube side. And once I make the, uh, once I get 20 to uh, 20 members and I'll make a video then. And anybody who comments on the video will be entered and a little while after that, we'll do the drawing and see who gets them. Yeah, scallops are good. I mean, I don't know why I haven't made them in so long, but, uh, you know, they're damn tasty. Milo, you're getting tangled up in my half a mile of mic wire. I like this little lapel mic, but it's got like a 30-foot cord on it, which was great for working over by the stove, but sitting here in my chair when I'm that far away from the computer that it's plugged into is a little bit more wire than I really need. Hey, all right. I'm up to 13 members now. Only seven more, and we will have that drawing. So tell your friends, tell your family, grab complete strangers off the street, buttonhole them, and tell them, hey, go join this channel. The sooner you get there, the sooner we will have our drawing. Uh, when are the giveaways? Yeah, I just, just explained that. Not yet. You know, I'm one more closer to 20. And thank you so much for uh, joining. You can uh, you can join the uh, Facebook group too because that's for members only. And you know I've had to decline some people who've asked to join because they're not members, and I'm trying to keep it you know members only because you can do things over there that you can't do on here. You can do like you know members only giveaways and that sort of thing on Facebook, or you can't do them on a uh, on, a, on a YouTube, YouTube, you have to open it to everybody in order to stay within their terms of service. But if you're on Facebook and everybody is the members of the Facebook page, you can do it there too. So kind of a slick little workaround if I do say so myself. Yeah, put, yeah, dropping a hot pan in cold water is not a good idea. It can definitely crack it or warp it. Uh, one of the biggest ways of warping a pan though actually is overheating the center of it you know especially if you have a pan that's a lot bigger than your burner and you put it on the burner you crank the burner up on high it'll make the center of it real hot but it can't the heat can't spread out fast enough to even it out and with that hot spot in the center it tries to expand and it's got nowhere to go because it's all cold around it and usually it'll bow it down you know every once in a while it'll bow upwards you know, but nine times out of 10, the bottom of the pan will bowl downward. And that's what makes a pan wobble or spin when you put it on a flat surface. And, uh, you know, a lot of the really old, uh,
give me more of the super chats than they've paid for individual subscriptions so far. Yeah, I don't feel guilty about it. Just left out. <laughs> oh, Brenda, we won't leave you out too much. Well, you can't do memberships. Well, that's okay, too. It's always nice having you around regardless, and you're usually around, and it's always good to see you. Uh, try not to belch on air. It's not polite. Not that I'm terribly polite, but I just don't like to see that sort of thing on other people's channels, so I try to avoid it myself. Hey, we're coming up on 52 minutes. Yeah, and we'll shut her down at about an hour or so. But yeah, Brenda, you know, don't feel left out. We'll always try and include you whenever you're around. See here, trying to think if there's anything else I was going to try and cover this week. Yeah, like I said, I got got one more cooking video. It's a traditional Wisconsin recipe, but uh, for some reason people seem seem to associate it more with Minnesota, even though they stole it from us in the first place. And it ain't lutefisk because it ain't lutefisk season. One of these days, if I can find a decent source of uh, of dried cod that ain't terribly expensive, I'll have to make my own little fisk. My great-grandmother used to, and uh, it smelled like codfish and death when you're making it, but it's uh, pretty good otherwise. A lot of people are terrified by the smell of it, and it does smell fairly strong, but the taste is pretty mild as long as you don't... Uh, you know, don't boil it half to death to where it falls apart, you're okay. But nowadays, there's probably more people in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and up into the Dakotas that eat lutefisk than actually still eat it back in uh, Norway and Sweden where it came from in the first place. You know, it's got to be, got to be more of a tradition around here to sort of uh, remembering your culture. And we just passed uh, Set in Mai, which is the 17th of May. It's Norwegian Constitution Day when the uh, Norwegians became independence, independent from Sweden. Then Denmark became their own nation in, God, I forget the year, 1816, I think it was. Yeah, you mentioned that before, Brenda. Because uh, you know, you're gone for six months out of time working on the road. You know, I used to do quite a bit of that sort of thing too. But if you're off because you're crippled, I haven't gone back to work yet. I haven't really been pushing it all that hard because I got so much to do around here. But work has been kind of slow this spring anyway. There's a lot of projects on the books, but nobody's uh, really pulling the trigger yet on most of them getting actually started on it. But it'll be pretty steady once things finally do start firing up again you know there's quite a few little jobs going on all over the place but like i said you know i haven't really been been pushing it all that hard to get back to work but i'm gonna have to pretty soon regardless engelbritson sell lutefisk and other food via mail order yeah you know all the uh all the grocery stores around here carry it in the fall and in the winter because that's you know pretty much the traditional season for eating lutefisk or you can go down to the Lutheran church wherever you are and they usually got a lutefisk dinner at some point in October, November, December. And, uh, you know, the problem is freezing lutefisk doesn't do the texture any, any favors. You know, if you can make it fresh, you can uh, usually make it a lot better than you can after it's been frozen. But it's harder stuff to, uh, kind of hard to find it that hasn't been frozen. There's still a few places, you know, if you really want to look around for it. Yeah, Wisconsin expat. Yeah, you know, there's a 
a lot of odd things that we eat around here that you don't find a whole lot of other places. Yeah, and don't worry, Brenda, your super chats are always greatly appreciated. Snoring again, you silly mutt. Jesus. You know, Wisconsin's a lot more than just cheese and brats, although you know, cheese and brats are pretty much something you can live off of anyway. Anyway, it's been a little under an hour now, and I think I'll wrap her up here if there's any other any last questions, go ahead and ask them. Yeah, made the only lutefisk you ever liked. Yeah, a lot of people tell you the best recipe for lutefisk is uh, you take five pounds of lutefisk, and then you get rid of it. Yeah, I miss being on the road. Yeah, it was always kind of fun, you know, getting out there and wandering about out on the road. Done a fair bit of work, road work, not a whole lot, but done some. You know, did a lot of work away from home where you're out and about and gone for a couple of months at a time, or just back on the weekends. Hey, Grampy, you made her. They make the yeah lutefisk. There's a uh, there's Olson's. They're a big maker of lutefisk and uh, pickled herring. They're out of Minneapolis. <clears throat> Mock chicken legs. Oh, yeah. I haven't had that. Man, I haven't seen them in ages. Yeah, well, like, you'll like my next uh, recipe. It's a classic dish from this part of the country. And like I said, the Minnesotans stole it from us. So don't believe all the hype here on the Internet that it's a Minnesota thing. Oh, that's right, Prairie. You're one of them Prairie Province. Prairie Province gals up there on the big open spots on the map. Anyway, I'll give her a few more seconds and let the, because there's about a 10 second delay between this and, uh, between this and YouTube. Beer, meat, sticks, and cheese, yeah. Anyhow, uh, I'll see you all next week. And uh, hopefully you'll have a great week. And like I said, encourage everybody you can find to go ahead and uh, get the membership drive going so that we can yeah, pheasant butter glass on the wood stove. You might have to chase me down a pheasant. Let's see a few of them running around here every once in a while. Anyway, like I was saying, once we get 20 members, we're going to have the big uh, big drawing for a couple of things. And hopefully you'll enjoy the rest of the week until I see you again. Bye.